Thank you. So when my son was in third grade, so maybe eight or nine years old, uh, he went off on a hike with my husband in the hills above Los Angeles where we live. So they went off and when they uh, got to uh, the midpoint of their hike, they found a pond that was full of tadpoles. So of course they dumped out their thermos, scooped up the tadpoles and brought them home to mom. And I was not super delighted to see this jar full of squiggly things, but my husband assured me they were gonna go right away to the aquarium shop and figure out what they needed to turn, uh, to raise these guys into frogs. So they go off and then they come back a long time later and they have a huge aquarium and three kinds of sand and a special light and rocks and everything these critters could possibly want. And my son is just beaming and I think, oh, he's just happy because he scored all this cool stuff. But actually what he was so excited about was somebody he met at the aquarium shop. The aquarium shop guy. <laughs> so it turns out that the aquarium shop guy had gone on the same hike when he was about my son's age, had found tadpoles, had done a ton of research to figure out how to raise tadpoles into frogs. And this early experience, which was very much like what my son had, uh, was something that ignited his lifelong passion in aquatic creatures and eventually uh, led to him pursuing his path in life. And so he had infected my son with his enthusiasm and passion for aquatic creatures. Uh, so that was very interesting. And uh, for about uh, a year or so when, uh, since that encounter, when my son was asked that ubiquitous question, what do you want to be when you grow up? He would think, I'd say, well, that's hard because I could make robots or I could be a game designer or I know I could be an aquarium shop guy. <laughs> so today I'll be talking about technology, I'll be talking about learning, but really at the heart of the matter is this question of how can we help our young people find their aquarium shop guys? Those people who are passionate experts who want to share, who want to infect young people with their passion and enthusiasm about what they know and what they love and ignite a lifelong passion for learning. So fast forward now a few years. My son is now a sophomore in high school. He towers over me to check things out. Uh, so he can Google for anything that's piqued his interest. He can find his new aquarium shop guys. He can connect with other peers who share a similar curiosity and interest. Uh, so the question that's in front of us today is really uh, how can we best support young people who are growing up in an era of absolute abundance of access to information and social connection like our young learners are? Uh, so our institutions of education were founded in a very different era, an era which was characterized by much more information scarcity, where finding access to information expertise really required a different kind of setup, a different kind of institutional configuration. And young people today are growing up in an era when all of this is at their fingertips, whether it's connection to information, connection to their peers, or connection to experts and expertise. And so we're at a very interesting moment where we're trying to reconcile these two things and where our modes of educating and connecting with young people uh, haven't quite meshed with the opportunities that are out there uh, in the online and network worlds. So the question as educators is what happens when these young people who are always connected, who are in, used to these interactive type of formats, uh, what happens when they encounter our modes and institutions of learning that were perfected in a very different age? Now, sometimes they do things that we're really happy about, like forming study groups on Facebook, going online to find information, going deep into areas of specialty, but they also do things that we're less happy about, like going to uh, ready-made download essay sites, or this is my latest favorite, so these services that take online courses. Um, <laughs> So the issue today is that now that the 
this kind of communication, this peer-to-peer -peer communication at the student layer is so ubiquitous and speedy, there's no way that we really can expect that young people aren't going to be sharing and finding information uh, in this way. Uh, so we can lament how social media or these kinds of sites are really eroding our cherished ways of doing things, or we can look at this kind of ingenuity and peer sharing as an actual opportunity uh, for learning. Uh, it's really, really become difficult in this day and age to be playing whack-a-mole with young people in the expectation that you can somehow limit the circulation and sharing of knowledge and information. Uh, and these problems really only arise when learning is disconnected from meaningful inquiry, right? When it's really just about filling in the blanks of an answer that the kids know the teacher already has, when it's not about authentic problem solving, uh, when it's not about real world impact, uh, when it's just about getting the grade, when it's about getting a line in the resume. Uh, so this is really, in a way, a really interesting challenge that the new media environment poses for us. Now we know that, um, you know, and this isn't just a digital thing, but engagement has been an issue. Uh, and it's more of an issue nowadays. So young people, research shows that young people enter school pretty eager and excited to learn. And then over time, their engagement with school drops. This isn't a new phenomenon. And so by the time they enter the environments that I encounter young people in higher ed, uh, you know, this is research by one of my colleagues, uh, Richard Aram and Josef Orozco, where they did uh, research on the gains in things like problem solving and critical thinking, sort of higher order stuff among college freshmen and sophomores, and they found that almost half of uh, kids in those years learned almost nothing, made almost no gains in their first years of college. So that's pretty damning ev evidence of you know, uh, what, what I see as an engagement problem, especially as young people get older uh, in the school system. So today we're facing a culture clash between uh, models and institutions of learning that were perfected in a prior age with a very different kind of technological but also social and economic picture and today's network knowledge ecosystem where things are changing very quickly. Uh, the economic outlook, careers, the kinds of skills that kids need are also changing very quickly in an era of much faster and ubiquitous kinds of information flow. Now this gap, I think it's important to realize between in school and that out of school learning looks different for different kids. So these are again numbers from the US about how enrichment expenditures for out of school learning have tripled in the US among wealthier families from an average of about $3,000 a year to almost $9,000 a year. Uh, for poorer families, that number has stayed uh, relatively uh, stable at about $1,000 a year per family, uh, not because they don't want to have uh, enrichment opportunities for their kids, but because of the economics of it. And what this shows is that the families with means are really understanding that nowadays it takes a lot more than just doing well in school, getting grades, moving through the uh, pipeline that kids are really expected to have those extracurriculars, to have those athletic experiences, to have those uh, specialized arts kind of offerings. And in fact, a lot of those out of school experiences are where young people get that first experience of making a genuine contribution to society and culture through performance, through athletics, through creative production, getting recognized, connecting with uh, mentors and other peers in something that they care about, having that firm handshake, looking a grown up in the eye, and finding a place for themselves. Now, in theory, all of these uh, incredible new online learning resources, tools, uh, interactive forms of learning media, learning analytics, these offer an opportunity to close the gap, to close the gap both in terms of the more uh, engaged and privileged learners and those who are less so to close the gap between in school and out of school learning. Uh, and this stuff has been really taking off, right? I mean, this is just a graph about uh, MOOCs, which is only one of you know, many kinds of new online learning opportunities. Uh, but we are living in an era where this kind of uh, free, open, ubiquitous kind of uh, educational resources becoming more and more pervasive. 
so I'm sort of curious uh, to see those of you here. How many of you have taken a MOOC or an online course of some kind? Wow, yeah, I would say that looked like 70, almost 80%. How many of you finished, completed a class? Oh, God, you guys are good educators. That number is way higher than the standard. Um, and in fact, you know what? All of you in this room are a pretty good representative of the kinds of people who take MOOCs, right? And this is one of the issues for those of us who study educational technology, is the tendency when you drop a new set of, a novel set of new learning tools, especially techie ones, they tend to give advantage to people who are already really highly educated and really engaged. So we know from research on MOOCs that it's still overwhelmingly people who already have degrees in higher education who are taking MOOCs. Uh, this was substantiated in a new study in science that came out just a few months ago, which shows that like, if you look at the top line, those are the MOOCy people, and then the bottom, dark red, are the general population, higher educational attainment, uh, higher median income. Not surprising, right? But when we think about this whole thing about democratizing everything through technology, it's really, really important to realize that the one constant about this digital ecology is that it's creating difference, choice. So it means that the kids who are growing up in an environment that are really well supported, where their parents are right there on every opportunity, pushing them to try new things, they have superpowers, right? But it also gives the kids who are less engaged an opportunity to do a whole lot of things that may not be part of their progression in the kind of schooling we care about. So as educators, I think we need to be really mindful of uh, you know, doing work to make sure all this cool new stuff is meeting all kids. Not the kid, like it has a tendency, like the kids who we are least concerned about are the ones who are on it, right? We know these kids, they're on it. Like they're doing amazing things with these new learning opportunities, but there are a lot of kids who aren't. And our current, you know, just the state of the research is showing that we're in an environment where technology is actually increasing the gap between the educated and engaged and the less so, rather than the closing the gap scenario, right? It doesn't have to be that way, but that's historically what's been happening, and that seems to be where things are today, which makes our job ever the more important because we can't just leave it up to sort of the naturally occurring kind of learning and initiative of young people and their families. So let's make it a little bit more concrete. Um, I'll give an example. So this is what I do. I hang out with kids and play games with them and uh, observe what they do on the internet when they're learning around their passion and interests and connecting with their online affinity groups. So uh, Minecraft is obviously a, a big thing these days with kids. So uh, one of the young uh, learners that we looked at as part of our research was Tal, who was 11 at the time we spoke to her, and she loves playing Minecraft. And Tal, uh, she got introduced uh, to Minecraft through her family. She had a cousin uh, who's into it, and they also go to the same school, which is an innovative uh, new school called Quest, or relatively new school, called Quest to Learn. Uh, in New York City, which was a school designed around a game-based pedagogy. So it was a school that even, this was a while ago, but even back then they were very supportive of Minecraft and had a Minecraft club after school where her cousin uh, and her uh, engaged with other kids around Minecraft. And of course, because Minecraft, one of the really interesting things about the game is not only what you can do in the game, but the whole metagame, uh, what we call the metagame around uh, it, which is the YouTube videos, the wikis, the, you know, all of the resources that Minecraft players create around the game, storytelling, um, a lot of really interesting creative production that is happening around the game. So Tal is an avid participant within that metagame of Minecraft, and she got really into Minecraft YouTube videos, which a lot of kids do, and then she brought it back to school and said uh, we should make them at the club. Uh, she started write, doing the script writing for the videos, and because the teachers at the school are very attentive to these kinds of opportunities, uh, they, uh, you know, the both her peers and teachers really uh, rewarded and commended her work 
in the Minecraft script writing. Uh, she was interviewed in the school paper. And eventually, she started developing and pursuing an interest in writing, which she hadn't had because of the interest in Minecraft and the supports she had. So if you look at Tal's learning, she had a passionate interest which was related to gaming and popular culture around Minecraft. She had support of peers uh, that also fostered that interest. That's not too unusual, right? But what was unusual and interesting is that because of the brokering and scaffolding role of the school, she was able to connect those interests in popular culture to opportunities that opened up new avenues for her learning in school. And when we interview a lot of young people, uh, we find that you know, often kids are geeking out on you know, gaming and fandom and all this stuff. Uh, and they're often going online to connect with uh, peers uh, in that passionate interest. But it's relatively rare for them to be able to close that loop and build a connection to school. And that's why Tal's case is very interesting. And it's an, it's an example of what we call connected learning, which in a nutshell is when young people are able to pursue learning that brings together something they're genuinely interested in, passionate about, uh, feel of affinity and identity with. Uh, and they have peers and mentors who share that interest and passion. And the last piece is the opportunity piece. So it's not enough for them just to be into something. But can you connect that interest, that peer group around that interest into an opportunity, whether it's educational uh, attainment, civic engagement, or career opportunity? So the moral of the story of Tal is not that new technology creates connected learners, but that uh, they're more the exception rather than the rule. And we've interviewed hundreds and hundreds of young people. And for most young people, they're actually struggling to make connections between the learning that they're doing at school, the learning they're doing at home and community. And they really don't know how what they're interested in can connect to their future career opportunities. So, a more typical kind of environment uh, is where young people will be pursuing interests in the home environment. They'll often have online communities that they're connecting with that the parents may or may not know something about, but very few connections to uh, formal education. Uh, now, why is this? You know, as educators, we often think of supporting young people's learning as a pipeline where we are uh, handing our young people off to the next uh, institution and that becoming uh, you know, good citizens and wage earners is coming through this kind of pipeline metaphor. But when we interview people who are successful, especially in careers like tech or uh, science and uh, technology, computer science, digital arts, a lot of these areas that we have been looking in our research at that are characterized by a lot of innovation and fast-paced change, that the pipeline is really only one part of the story, that in fact all of these people who have been successful in these careers have been supported by this incredibly diverse web of organizations, of people, of relationships and programs, internships that really uh, to some degree connect to the formal pipeline and are often brokered by the formal pipeline, but really exist as a whole set of networks outside. So, uh, you know, I think educators have always played a critical role in guiding young people to new interests and to new opportunities, both in school and out of school, whether it's a club, uh, music lessons, uh, advice on where to go to high school or college. Uh, but in an increasingly networked age where there is so much bountiful, free, and open educational resources and the opportunity to connect with others, peers and experts in areas of interest, our role as connection builders becomes even more critical. So it seems like a complex problem, right? Connection building across environments that we may know little about or have little control of. But at the core, uh, it is pretty simple. It's that you know, there are, on one hand, people who are experts, our aquarium shop guys, uh, who have the desire and the interest and passion to share, and then the kids who uh, need to be able to find them or know that they want to find them. Um, and it certainly doesn't require technology, just like my son visiting the aquarium shop didn't require fancy technology. Uh, but the internet can definitely help us. 
Uh, and there are learning heroes uh, in our everyday community, but all over the place, connectable now uh, because of the resources of the online world. So I think we've all had experiences of con connecting with people who have pushed us to try to uh, try something new, who have pushed us to go deeper into something uh, that we are already interested in, uh, and who have uh, really um, supported us to continue and persist in an engagement or a pursuit. Uh, so do you have an aquarium shop guy from your childhood, a family member, a peer, a mentor in adulthood, a professional community who has inspired you? Uh, and it can be somebody you don't know personally. It can be an author or a creative artist who has really inspired you to try something new or uh, to go deeper into something. Uh, so I want to... Uh, do a quick parent share uh, about who these learning heroes are in our lives. So uh, when I say go, and not until I say go, I want you to do four things. I want you to stand up. I want you to take 30 seconds each with one person, or if you're in an uneven group, two other people, uh, to share uh, who a learning hero is in your life. Uh, and then I want you to sit down and tweet with the hashtag learning hero. So stand up, 30 second share, sit down, tweet, go. Yeah, how many people had family members as learning heroes? Okay. How about teachers? Community members of some kind? Teachers are the winner, it seems like, with this group. <laughs> So it turns out that this uh, idea of learning heroes actually has some backing in the research literature. It's not just warm and fuzzy stories. I do qualitative work, so I collect stories, but I love it when the big quant people also find similar things. So here's uh, the results of a study of 30,000 graduates of higher education across a really wide range of institutions. And they found that the college experiences, it didn't matter so much if it was an elite school or a not so elite school, a big school or a small school, specialized or not specialized. There were two things that mattered in young people's undergraduate education. One was what you might call project-based learning. Did they engage in something, a sustained project that was more than a term long? It could be in school or extracurricular. And the second was the aquarium shop guy effect. Did they have uh, a faculty member who they connected with and uh, who they felt a connection with? And that, uh, those were the two things that really had significant effect sizes. Here's another uh, study, which is a really kind of uh, wonky uh, meta-analysis of uh, uh, mentoring program, youth mentoring programs, where they analyzed studies of dozens and dozens of youth mentoring programs, and they found that the one thing that was like a consistent finding that programs could do is if they matched young people based on sh and mentors based on shared interest, it made a difference. Like it's not surprising, but in fact, a lot of youth mentoring programs actually don't take interest and identity uh, into account when they match. So, uh, you know, the formal mentoring, like the, uh, what we call assigned mentor, those mentor programs like Big Brother, Big Sister, is only a really small fraction of the kind of mentoring that young people have in their everyday lives. So overall, you know, the vast majority of mentorship is more informal, the kind of learning hero type relationships that you all were talking about. And they span a really wide gamut. Um, you know, you'll see that family is, you know, way up there. Most young people have family who support them in their interests. Teachers are really high, friends, and then religious leaders, coaches, counselors, neighbors. Uh, you know, and again, we see a real difference between more privileged families and less privileged families in their access to informal mentorship. So that's, you know, again, not a surprising finding, but, um, you know, a troubling one, I think. Uh, so given that we know that social relationships are really important, that it's really important that kids connect their learning across settings, right? So that builds resilience, it, it, it builds purpose in their learning. And uh, we know that there's a growing abundance of opportunities to find these kinds of connections and opportunities given the network world. How can we as educators take full advantage of this uh, context of abundance? 
So again, I'll return to the connected learning model. Uh, you know, and it's really what's both interesting and challenging about connected learning is that there isn't a silver bullet. It's not like there's one tool or this one approach that's going to make connected learning happen for you. Uh, but the positive thing is that there's so many entry points, so many ways that you can su support connected learning and so many ways you can reach kids in various facets of their lives. And just as a caveat, when we talk about connected learning, we are not saying that all learning needs to be connected learning all the time, right? There is a time and a place for kids to learn basic skills, for kids to uh, learn things that they might not have a passionate interest in. There is also needs to be a space for kids to mess around and hang out with their friends in a way that's not colonized by adults trying to get them ahead in life. And so there's a real importance about having these spheres distinct, but we believe that every young person deserves to have that experience of doing something they really care about, supported by people who care about the same thing, and that helps them get ahead in the world. We just believe that every young person deserves to have that opportunity, and there are a lot of young people who aren't. So kids can enter into connected learning from so many different ways. Some kids start an interest because their friends are into it. You know, peer group drives it. Some kids are born like being passionately interested in something. And some kids get coaxed into doing something because it'll help them get recognized or get ahead in life. And kids are different. Their interests are diverse. Their motivations are diverse. And we think that's actually a huge opportunity. So when we talk about supporting as educators environments that uh, create these conditions for these spheres of learning to connect, we talk about them often having certain features uh, of being production-centered. So if people are making things together, that's often an opportunity for these connections to be built. Shared purpose. So it's not just you're making something, but you're making something for a reason whether that's to be civic, you know, give a contribution to your community, to create something uh, beautiful that's going to be shared with others, that there's a, there's a purpose, a social purpose to what uh, you're making. And then finally, there's an openly networked component so that you're leveraging some of the opportunities that the network world has to offer a broader stage for young people to connect uh, and share. So I'll close with just... Uh, two examples from some work that I've been involved in years, and I'm really looking forward to hearing more about the cool innovations you, you all are involved in. Uh, so are there any library folk in the room? Oh, great. Yeah, so we do um, a fair amount of work with libraries, and uh, the UMedia uh, network of teen learning labs is, uh, was founded in 2009 and started with uh, the main downtown library in Chicago, where they opened up over 4,000 square feet for a teen uh, digital maker space uh, that was modeled on a lot of the findings of the work uh, from our digital youth work. And uh, it was very interesting, uh, the digital youth network uh, partnered with Chicago Public Library on this to create a space that was really unique in the library setting, especially at that time. Now it's kind of a movement to have maker spaces in libraries, whether it's public libraries or school libraries. Uh, but, uh, you know, it was this idea that it was focused on production of forms of culture that really engaged uh, urban teens. So music, uh, spoken word, uh, digital arts, uh, gaming. Uh, they created a space that had the tools to support that, as well as mentors who were uh, professionals within those specialties. Uh, and all of these kinds of activities, whether it was spoken word or uh, creating uh, music, uh, was done in the context of you know, these projects or these uh, performances. or uh, It's the shared purpose principle. So for example, what you're hearing, seeing here is the weekly open mic where all of the spoken word artists would come together and perform and give each other feedback, and then they would go on to compete within citywide competitions and so on. So the music kids, they created a record label. The gaming kids had a podcast about gaming. So there's always some component where you're actually doing something that uh, together that makes a difference in the world. And then finally, even though this is a physical space and a maker space, they're leveraging this idea that they're part of that broader ecosystem of Chicago, whether that's participating in 
competitions or other citywide kinds of opportunities, and the kids are constantly pushing uh, the outcomes of their work onto the open web. It's incredibly transformative for kids, like even if it's only two people who are listening to their gaming podcast, the idea that there is an audience out there for something that, are, that they're producing is a really, really big deal. And then the other example I wanted to share is my current passion project, which is a small benefit corporation uh, that we launched last year called Connected Camps, which for the moment is focused on delivering online learning experiences through Minecraft. So again, on this principle of meeting kids where they are with their interests, but also putting a wrapper around them, which is educator scaffolded, right? So our servers are very different from the kinds of servers that are out there in the wilds of the open internet. And we found that, uh, especially for parents of young girls, they often weren't comfortable with their kids just going out on like open servers where they didn't know who was gonna be on the other end and where there wasn't always a lot of really great moderation. Uh, so we uh, have created sort of an environment where we hire high school and college counselors who are, you know, again, these are the passionate peer group. These are the kids who know more about Minecraft than anybody else because they've grown up with it and we train them to be counselors and run build challenges to teach coding courses. So it's an authentic peer community around a passion area, but it's one that is highly scaffolded by educational goals that center around creating things together. Uh, and so there'll be like weekly build challenges, there'll be uh, survival challenges, there'll be uh, you know, uh, shared governance challenges that our counselors set up to create the sense of you know, good digital citizenship to model it as well as push kids uh, to learn engineering and coding and design concepts through their play. And then finally, we don't have to work very hard uh, to make Minecraft openly networked because it's already an environment that lives in this kind of soup of connectivity. So those are just two examples of many examples of efforts that are uh, seeking to foster uh, and enact connected learning principles. Uh, I think the great thing, again, about connected learning is that all of us can be part of the solution, whether we're educators, technology makers, parents, or just somebody who's passionate about something and has something to share. Uh, the online world really makes it easy uh, for us to share what we know, to connect with others who are doing the same. Uh, but there is one thing that's even easier than you know, going out on a Q&A forum or putting your lesson plans online or whatever it is. Uh, so remember that learning hero you talked about just a few minutes ago with your partner. One really simple thing you can do that would make me very, very happy today or before the event is over is just to make sure, does that person know the role that they played in your life? Do they know that they were a learning hero? And even if they do, they're probably going to be delighted to hear it again. So pick up the phone, send out a tweet, send an email, whatever it takes to reach them. And please, please, please just let them know the role that they've had in your life. Every day, little things, appreciation, recognition, connection, these are the things that make a difference. Uh, the, the secret sauce about connected learning is that a little bit goes a long way. What may seem like something at the margins of what you're doing as an educator is life-changing for kids. And that's what makes connected learning and interest-driven learning so critical is because the bang for the buck is so high when you're able to really reach a young person and make a difference in something that they care about. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.